Luther said something very interesting. He wrote this in Latin. It says, Simul justice et peccator. That means simultaneously saved and simultaneously lost. This is quite a challenge to, uh, to investigate what he's trying to say. To me it says, with my sinful nature, I'm lost. But with what Christ did for me on the cross, I'm saved forever. So please don't let your focus be too much on your situation because your situation will always be in a mess. As long as you live, you'll have this fallen human nature. So try and focus on the gift of salvation procured for you at Calvary. In our previous lecture, we read about a very strange phenomenon. The sun refused to shine. It wouldn't shine on the agony of Jesus hanging on the cross. Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, that's 12 o'clock, until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Both the literal sun and the metaphorical sun, the heat of our sins, were taking its toll on Jesus. Isaiah 53 verse 2, He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. Can you see that lacerated victim on the cross? It's just one big bleeding wound. When our sin separated him from the Father, his face became so twisted <laughs> that people would hardly look at him. He, the fairest of the universe, allowed my sins to strip him from his beauty. <clears throat> Verse 3, And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Were you there, says the Negro spiritual, when they crucified my Lord? Where does God fit into this great redemption drama? Somewhere in the cosmos on his elevated throne? No, no, no. He was next to his son at Calvary. He veiled his glory. Otherwise, it would have blown up this planet. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. How did he do it? Through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ. Do you fathom this? Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So in the reconciling process, the Father was there. God the Father blackens the bright sun and takes his position next to Jesus, who is dying under the load of, of my sin, of your sin. What a solemn moment. God is reconciling the world to himself. This was a divine teamwork. When he poured out his wrath on Jesus, he was next to Jesus, whose suffering was the most severe. The Father's or the sons. You know, the greatest pain comes when we punish someone we love dearly. I shall never forget her pleading, weeping little face. Daddy, please don't punish me. I will never, never, never do it again. Please, please.
please, please, don't punish me. As I looked into her tear-filled eyes and listened to a little voice pleading for grace, pleading for grace, pain mingled with love crushed me. Have you experienced this? By the way, never punish your child when you're angry. Wait till you normalize. Then it's going to be very difficult. When I put her on my lap and disciplined her, my pain far exceeded that little girl's pain. We were very close to one another. For nine years, I prayed for this little child to come into our lives. And God gave us this precious gift. She was not going to live. The doctor said, she's going to die within 72 hours. But I, I stayed next to the incubator. I just prayed and prayed and prayed. And when the 72nd hour arrived, her breathing was normal and she's still alive. Now suddenly, Loretta and myself experienced pain in our relationship. And for a little child, it was difficult to grasp why her daddy, who loved her so much, is punishing her. The little brain couldn't fathom that. When the discipline was over, I took my sobbing, trembling little sweetheart in my arms. And then I joined her, crying. Transgression cannot escape punishment. This is part of, of life. But the way I punished my child, God the Father could not do to his son was a different situation. He did not die in the arms of a comforting father. Like my child was in my arms when I punished her. But Jesus died in the wrath of the father alone. Yes, Loretta, when she was a little baby, and the father may not support and embrace him as I did to my child. The price he paid for my sins did not allow it. Can you imagine what God must have gone through? On Calvary, another heart broke. The heart of God the Father. For God so loved you that he gave into death his son. In order to save us, God had to cause the death of his son. He caused the death of Christ. Who suffered most, the father or the son? It is harder to see a loved one suffer than it is to suffer yourself. Did you get the message? It's harder to see a loved one suffer than it is to suffer yourself. My dearest child, if only I could suffer in your place. Have you said this? When you saw your child suffering, God, can't I suffer in my daughter's, my brother, my sister's place? John 3.16, what a verse, what a verse. On Calvary, two were crucified. God the Father and God the Son. Jesus is in the process to die under the weight of our sins. He suffers from an indescribable loneliness without his Father. You know, Many times people commit suicide when they lose a partner. His only companion is the wrath of God which is consuming him. Every second in this midnight darkness, 
is for Jesus like an eternity. Next to him is God the Father of eternity, caught up in the cruel tentacles of time, became part of this phenomenon called time, standing next to the cross and punishing his son to death. Both of them suffer painfully till the price for our sin is fully and completely paid for. Both hearts are painfully shattered in a million, million painful pieces. One day in heaven I want to know more from Jesus about those three hours of suffering in that terrible darkness outside and inside. And if I may, I would love to put the same question to the Father. Do you think he's going to speak to us? Oh, can you imagine such a privilege speaking to us? You know, you cannot speak to a celebrity any time you want to. But the Trinity is there for us for, to communicate with us. The love of the Father and the Son which we will enjoy in heaven will make it difficult for us to remember the hardships of life. You know, sometimes we're in a crisis and suddenly we're out of it and we enjoy life. Then it's hard to think back in retrospection of how difficult it was. But in heaven, life on earth will just vanish into the beauty and joy of heaven. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first cry on Calvary. Second one, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Third one, woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. Number three, number four, just before the three hours of darkness ended, Jesus uttered a cry which was darker than the darkness that enveloped the cross. 27, 46 of Matthew says, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This is Aramaic, his home language. Translated, it says, My God. My God, twice. Why have you forsaken me? No one else ever experienced this God forsakenness. Why did he leave me after 10 years of a happy married life? She told me. It is so painful because I still love him. A billion voices on this planet sings the same in the same choir. The same melody with the same lyrics. Why have you, my dear husband, my sweetest wife, my child, my parent, do say ever, why did you forsake me? As the hurting choir members die, near ones take their places. Only Jesus really fully understands this painful melody and the lyrics of rejection. Not only did people walk out of his life, God the Father forsook him and walked out of his life. Now this was a sad case. After 50 years of marriage, he fell in love with her. I think she was about 30. This was devastating to his wife. Together they created an empire of deep love and understanding. Cries from her old voice and broken heart is heard, Sweetheart, sweetheart, why did you leave me? We were together for 50 years in a happy relationship. Why did you leave me? 
suddenly the strong bond from eternity between father and son is gone. Instead of love and acceptance, he experiences God's wrath against sin. From his parched lips, I heard the most heart-rendering words ever spoken. And this will be our study, the curriculum throughout eternal ages. Why, God, why are you forsaking me? Oh, what pain, oh, what agonizing. His only company is the stench of my rotten, contaminated sins. He yearns for the pure, uncontaminated communion with his Father and cries out, My God, I need your companionship. Where are you? Why does he endure it all? Because he had to endure the wrath of God in our place in order to forgive and save us. Jesus dies without hope, without God. And in the same way that lost sinners will one day die without hope and without God. The wages of sin is Death. Which death? The first or the second one? If Jesus didn't die in our place, we all had to die. Do we as sinners realize what kind of divine gifts we receive when we accept him as our personal savior? Our sins are being canceled. And one day in heaven we will not be treated as forgiven criminals, but as if we had never sinned. What a package. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross. His flesh lacerated with stripes. Those hands so often reached out in blessing. Nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tireless on ministries of love spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns, those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe. All that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to each child of humanity, declaring, It is for you that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. It is for you the most expensive salvation operation. It is for you that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For you he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. Through his sacrifice we can enter paradise. He who still the angry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead, to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice, and this from love to you, to you. We receive his perfect, uncontaminated righteousness and escape the punishment of death and being lost forever. We don't have to be consumed in hellfires and burned to ashes, annihilated forever. He was separated from his father so that we could live in his presence forever. Forsaken by the father so that we could be accepted 
by the Father. My God, my God. So that sinners, that's the reason I forsook you, my son. So that sinners like you and me can be saved. The fifth utterance, John nineteen twenty eight. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. At three o'clock, the sun begins to shine again. After the protracted struggle, dehydration, loss of blood, high blood pressure, high fever, he cries out for a little water. Fulfillment of prophecy. Psalms 22, 16. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue clings to my jaws. 29. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. Have you ever been to a dying person? What do they do? They take a sponge or a piece of cloth or cotton and put it on those parched lips. I've seen it so many times. They apply water to his lips so that he could speak the most meaningful words ever spoken. With a little strength left, he cries out, Telesai, Greek. It is finished. John 19, 30. It is finished. The word finished rolls from his lips. The echo through the Palestinian air the words, it is finished, echoes from galaxy to galaxy. Telestai, it is finished. They reach the unfallen world. Telestai, it is finished. With joy unspeakable, the words, it is finished, reaches the city of God. What was finished? What has been achieved? A planet pushed out of its orbit by sin, gliding without direction and found by divine love, rebooted, as we say in modern language, and placed back on its original gravitational orbit. The terrorist who captured this planet was unmasked. Nobody will ever be fooled by his false credentials. It is finished. The folder of this cyber criminal has forever been deleted twice. The query about my future has been declared. It is finished. It's been declared. A mansion has been built where no intruder will steal my eternal happiness. No need for funeral cover. It is finished. Telestai, it is accomplished. All those who died in Christ will be resurrected. Telestai. It is finished. It's completed. It is finished. The price for my sins had been paid by the blood of the Lamb. Throughout a billion eternities, I will try to express my heartfelt gratitude for saving a wretch like me. The seventh and last one says... Luke 23, 46, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last, and his head fell on his chest. The price. Was paid. Can
and you see the scene. He disappears into the dark chasm of the pangs of the second death. What an expensive price to pay for a wretch such as I. What two events transpired at his death? At three o'clock, the lamb, representing the coming Messiah, was brought to the temple. What is going to happen with the lamb at the temple? Just before cutting its throat, something happens. A mysterious sound is heard coming from the curtain, uh, which suddenly torns from top to bottom. The earth trembles. The knife falls from the hand of the priest and the lamb escapes. There he goes, gone. When Christ died, type met anti-type. Henceforth, he will be the lamb we offer for our sins. The ironic priesthood ended at the death of Jesus. Next time, We'll study the reactions of the people who watched the crucifixion. May we, by beholding Jesus, be transformed into his unselfish image. May the Holy Spirit enlighten our minds concerning the amazing manner in which God saves unmerited people like you and me. Thank you, Father, that you accomplished our salvation. Thank you that this is a completed task. The gift of eternal life is being offered to us. The cloak of Jesus' righteousness are extended to us. Help us, weak, naked, filthy sinners, to accept that perfect cloak of unmerited righteousness and look forward to the day when pain and sin will be gone forever. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) 